the beauty of this church. And I know if you're here a long time, it probably wears off a little bit, but I hope it doesn't, because you have a gem here. I was here about 10 years ago, and I enjoyed it very much, and I do remember the church, both inside and outside, but it didn't have the sparkle that it has now. And I know a lot of work went into that, and that's a wonderful tribute to the Catholic community, and I understand beyond the Catholic community of Macon. And so when I go around the country and I see these beautiful churches, and they are some wonders. Churches that were built hundreds of years ago and are monuments to little towns much smaller than Macon. It's a beautiful thing to recognize the love, the affection, the sweat, the tears, and finances that went into building those wonderful edifices of the Lord. The carving out, the stained glass, and the rest, all of that, so beautiful. But they represent the lives of people, our forefathers and mothers, gone before us. And so we pray that in the canon of the Mass, all of those who are gone before us. And how beautiful a custom it is that we, this morning and last night as well, and this evening, commemorate those who have died in the parish, even with their names printed out in a scroll, and let all of us chant that, commemorating those people that we know. But they also are the people that have built the church, that have continued to maintain the churches all around the country. We want to pray for them as well. This is a month of life and death, the saints, and of course the death that remember of our people, but it isn't the final death because they're in purgatory and they're waiting for that moment, which is more sure in their hearts and minds than we will ever have on this side of that moment that we call death. But the biggest cause of death in our land in a different vein here takes a life every 23 seconds. 4,000 a day die from this, 1,300,000 every single year, and in the last 41 years practically, some 57 million have died. I'm not talking about cancer, I'm not talking about heart problems or any other medical disease, but I am talking about a uh, moral disease that has affected both the living and the dead. The living, because of the words that we use, the terms that we use, our medicine, our law, our politics, our media, our education, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the A word, abortion. By far the hugest cause of death in any society. But just in this country, some 57 million children have been annihilated at some stage of pregnancy in this country since Roe v. Wade some almost 41 years ago launched abortion on demand. And we need to be reminded of that because the media is going to paint it in a different way. They're going to paint it out as a woman's right to choose. Let's look at those three words for a moment. Woman, I'm sure she's a woman, but she's more than a woman, isn't she? She is a mother. He's more than a boyfriend or lover or whatever, or even spouse for that matter. He's a father. You see, the war here is about gender sometimes. It's not the only war. It's a war against God, of course. But one of the manifestations is to pry apart the beauty of the confidence that should be between husband and wife or between spouses or between man and woman in a good sense. And certainly the relationship of child and mother. So it's important for us when we talk about this issue that we use the most appropriate word. Nothing wrong with the word woman or man, but they're just not complete. They don't tell the full picture. And we need to bring that picture back because there's a society, there's all of these areas in our lives and the secularization of society that has snuffed us out. Right, woman's right to choose. Well, since when do we have the right to do what is wrong? We don't have that right. So much is about, today is about rights. You know, when we look at the legal things, when we look at the pushing for changes in our society and many different forces out there, it's about rights, my right, my right. And we've forgotten, unfortunately, to a large extent, responsibility. With every right, there's a responsibility, but it goes this way. If we keep looking for our rights and our rights only, we will never have the responsibility that I need for you and you need for me. 
But if we look at responsibility, we will assure our rights. For us, it's important to remember that the responsibility flows from the commandments of God. The rights are there as well, but that's more of a reward, if you will. It's just, it's right for us, it should be there, but it flows from the responsibility of observing God's law. And so a woman's right to choose, wow, now there's one. You chose to come to church this morning. Good choice, because God wants you to do that. It's expected, but it is a good, wholesome, moral choice. But some things are just wrong, and some things will never be made right by trying to call it something that sounds right and pleasant to our ears, such as freedom of choice. The freedom of choice that we have is something that relies on something that's good. Choice here is an abomination because it refers to the slaughter of a child. But you see, it's not mentioned, and that's the trick. Keep it silent, keep it covered. Don't say the word mother, keep it covered, just say woman. Don't say the word responsibility, make it a right. Don't say the word killing the unborn, call it a choice. See what's happening? And that's what our society in one little phrase has done to the meaning of life. And that, of course, reflects also at the end of life when we talk about euthanasia, when we talk about mercy killing, when we talk about many other things in between. But this is the hurricane that spawns the tornadoes. The tornadoes are those smaller areas are big, but compared to the hurricane, they're small. The hurricane is the abortion issue because of the numbers that we're talking about. And when we have anesthetized our society to thinking that it's okay, because it's legal after all, <laughs> then do we have any wonder that we have killings at Columbine High School or other high schools? around the country, is that simply totally removed from the fact of the killing of the unborn? I doubt it. And so we need to look at this. Now I mentioned 57 million unborn children. If there have been that number, then what about the mothers? Notice I didn't say women, I said mothers, who have indeed gone through those abortions. What about them? Uh, are their lives just going on, plain and simple? Some would like to say that in the abortion movement. Some stand up and say, oh, it didn't matter to me. I just went on with my life. But there are millions that are not saying that. There are millions, and many of them are coming forth. And it's beautiful to see. Why is it beautiful? Because it changes the evil to good. And they're basically crying out. We have letters in Staten Island, our office in New York, where I work, Priest for Life. And those letters you can get online. You can look at them, search a little bit, you'll find that. Letters from mothers who are writing about their past and how they rue, how they're sorry about what they have done. They regret it, but they feel in some ways it's difficult to find me some relief from the pain. What is the pain? Bouts of crying, depression, alcohol, a lot of different things that coalesce into this ball of wax which we call post-abortion syndrome. And that's the, the effect of this. You see, we think in terms of the child being slaughter. That's true. But in every abortion there are at least, at least two casualties. And the mother is one of them too. She lives on in some ways approaching a death. And that's what some people even who have been there address it as. Now the good news is that from this there are retreats that are offered all over the country as a matter of fact all over the world. Translated into 17 languages in different countries. And these are Rachel's Vineyard Retreats. Rachel's Vineyard Retreats. Strange name. Rachel. Who was Rachel? Rachel in the Old Testament was the person who said, Rachel weeping for her children, for they are no more. That's a figurative way of talking about Israel, who is now taken into the Babylonian captivity. In the New Testament, after Christmas, we know what Herod wanted to do. He wanted to slaughter the Christ child. He didn't get there because God had another plan, didn't he? They went off to Egypt. What happened though, Herod went along with his plan and slaughtered the babies in Bethlehem. And we celebrate that on the 28th of December as the Feast of the Holy Innocents, the first martyrs of the church, really, in the name. And so these babies are taken from the arms, as it were, of the mothers. And Matthew, in relating the story, quotes from the Old Testament saying, Rachel, weeping for her children, 
for they are no more. He's applying it now to this. And so the word Rachel refers to those who are grieving over the loss of their child in the past. You know, it's not about condemning somebody. It's not even about telling them their guilt. They know their guilt and they have to confess that. But it's more about the grief and the pain and the hurt that needs to be healed that these retreats are about. And so the word vineyard, Rachel's vineyard, was the vineyard. It's a place of growth. It's a place where things can be chopped down to nothing, and they should be, as we know in horticulture, in order to produce great vines, great shoots out, shoots. And so a vineyard is a place of wine, a place of grapes, a place of something fruition. And that can happen. Rachel becoming one who has new life. That's what these retreats do. Now, I'm not just talking about the retreats, but I want to put a big plug in for them because you do have them here, and they're around the country. It's some 800 a year. And on a Friday evening, they'll come in through people, anonymous. Nobody has to know where they are. And those who are in there on the team that work with them, everybody's pledged to it, confidentiality. So this is strong. But in the course that they have in common, because they've all been in that same place of that abortion sometime, they can relate their story and something is triggered off in the mind and heart of another person. That's me. You're talking about me. That's what's in their head. You know, sometimes they're not even telling anybody about this. They're the ones first ones to know. What does that do? It opens up a new channel that they can share. They're not celebrating that past. They are indeed acknowledging it. That's a first step out of the denial that is gross across our land in this whole issue. You know, the news media is a total denier of it, or it's on the side of pushing it, which makes it even worse. So the good news, though, is that by Sunday, there are tears that are shed as well. Those tears now that were sorrowful on Friday now turn to tears of joy. Joy, what are you talking about? Joy over an abortion? No, not at all. Joy that must have been in the heart of Zacchaeus when Jesus said, Zacchaeus, come down out of that tree. You've got better places to go, and I have better places to be with. I want to be with you today. The joy that allowed him then to come forth, despite the fact that people were grumbling about him, that were ready to pounce on him, because after all, he wasn't at the top of the list of the party list. You know, he was a tax collector. I don't think that was uh, somebody that they would ingratiatingly bring to their home. Jesus wants to go there. Oh, I love it because he sees something and it takes from him what was ready there, the sense of generosity, and he spills his guts out as it was and said, I will give back to anybody I frauded and I'll pay them back 400%. Now, in Jewish tradition, in the book of Numbers, you can read it, it says you used to pay back 20% over what you frauded. He's going to be 400 percent. So he's generous there and, of course, giving up half of his things as well. That's because Jesus' love was there. And that's what these mothers recognize and fathers who were involved in this. They recognize at the end of this retreat, over the weekend, a change in the heart that takes place because of the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Could you imagine? You know, the world says out there, and we're so used to it, we accept it, you know. I don't get angry. I just get even. We've all experienced that, and maybe in homes as well, which is wrong. It's certainly an industry in sports and many fields. It's out there. I just get even. Could you imagine if Jesus Christ came on this earth to get even with us? Where would we be today? Let's be honest about it. And so, this is what we have to tell the world around us, that there is a God who loves us. What's Christmas all about? Without the child, take away the child and you have tinsel. It's the child that makes everything. And that child is tender. The child is not one that's ready to pounce on you like a potentate somewhere throwing lightning bolts or darts. He's vulnerable and he could have been snuffed out unless God had told Joseph to take the child and his mother into Egypt. Now God's plans are not our own. Recognition, of course, of this child in the womb is so essential to our future as a civilization. 
You know, it's not a homily about don't have an abortion. Obviously, that's the begin there. Don't. But I'm not telling you that. I'm telling you to take this to people who are not going to church, the 80% who are not here today. Maybe there are more in here in this parish than in other parishes. I don't know. But the average around the country is about 20, 20 sorry, about 28% that are going to church. So about 70% that are not. They need to hear the word. Because they're getting the gospel of Jay Leno or Oprah Winfrey instead of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we need to bring the message beyond it. We need to pray, number one. Pray for a conversion of hearts. Pray for the conversion of the hearts of those people who are doing the dirty work in those centers. Now, I know you don't have them down here in the city, but they're around. They're up in Atlanta, so sure. And they're in Columbus. But we need to pray for those people. Change of heart. I don't know what's in their head, but we know what they're doing. And we can't deny that. We need to pray. We need to persuade one another. Not simply to let this be and let other people just take over. What did it say in that first reading? It says, pray for those who are doing the wrong thing and to talk to them about that and tell them about that. That's the responsibility we have. Not simply, not simply to, uh, not simply to, um, you know, just have people go their way and I go their way. No, we have a responsibility. It doesn't mean that we pry into people's lives, but it means when we see something that is so terrible as this, we need to say something about it. We need to help people who are <clears throat> thinking the wrong way on this issue. Because they get that mantra all the time. If not the very words itself, well then the idea behind a woman's right to choose. As if this is a higher right than protecting the unborn in the womb. So we need to pray as well as persuade. But we also need to be present to people. 40 Days for Life, which I see beautiful signs about here, and some of you have been involved in 40 Days of Life, 40 Days for Life. That's all over the country. There's about 260 different cities that are doing that, or more now. And it's great because you can go on the internet and see what's happened in different places. This baby was saved today at that center. This person has walked out of the killing center and now is a voice for life. That's great. That's the change. You see, it's not where we've come from that matters. It's where we're going to that matters in our lives. We can speak about that from an eternal perspective, the most important way, but also even right here on earth. And that's what Rachel's Vineyard tries to do, is to pull people out of that pain into healing, so that then they have a new lease on life. They are wounded healers, wounded healers, and they're able to help other people through their problems as well. Sister, don't go there, it's a dead end street. Brother, be a man and stand up for the person you claim you love. That's the message. And the message we need to get there, too, for others, to help them in charity. So our prayer, our persuasion, our presence, and also our political responsibility, we need to vote for those people who are pro-life. Sometimes it's hard to find. I admit that. But we need to do it early. We need to read more than what the media tells us, because they're not going to tell us much about their position on this most important point. Well, tell us about the leaves out there and the issues. Where are the leaves and the trees now so beautiful today? They're going to be gone in six weeks, but they dazzle our eyes today. But the roots and the trunk are important. But if we have that position, we got them right. By the analogy, I'm talking about our perspective and things in life. What's important? What's important is defending life. Our founding fathers got it right when they said life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. They got it in right got it in the right order. And they recognized it was not given by George Washington, John Hancock, or anybody else, or Barack Obama, or whoever in the Supreme Court. It was given by the Creator. And the government, therefore, has not the slightest authority to take it away. And yet they have. So our political responsibility is real because it represents God's plan on this earth. So when you go and vote on Tuesday or whenever we do it, we pull that lever. I hope the first thing that is in your mind is, how would God want me to vote to represent his law in the best candidate? And finally, perseverance. Because, you know, even with slavery and many other huge issues, this was not something that was just done in a terrible, terrible conflict of four years of civil war. It was something that festered over centuries. We 
You also know that this is something which is probably not going to go away overnight, although I'd love it to be gone yesterday. And so we need to recognize it in terms of the patience that God sees, and we read the Old Testament readings and the New Testament readings the same about patience in the Lord. But even when it was very dark, they came to the tomb, but they had a problem. Who will roll the stone away? The big stone that covered the tomb of Christ. Who will roll it away? Why? Because all they wanted to do was to anoint a good, holy man who died, and they were grieving over it. But they wanted to give him this recompense. They wanted to give him what was his honor, as good Jewish ladies should do. And they went there, but they had a problem. There's a stone that's in the way. That was the biggest problem. We know the answer to that. God blew open the stone and didn't reveal a dead man, but the Lord of the Lord, King of Kings, our God Almighty, in Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, you are here today only because of that. For 2,000 years. So even when it was very dark, we can look and see the light that shines through the darkness. Shines as it shines through these beautiful stained glass windows, which are a history and a story of Christ's life on earth. And he's with us today and will be with us. Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. Brothers and sisters, come down from that despondency and be with me, because I will give you life. Let us now, each and every one of us, as we continue, and I know you're doing this, and I thank you for what you're doing in your parish, in your community, in your families, in your workplace, to continue to bring the sense of life. We are made in the image and likeness of God. And let us work together to give those who have no voice the only decent choice, and that is the inevitable and inalienable right to live. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.